Nobody likes dirty business. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have imagined that I would have my hands full of dirt, that my career would depend on soil, what we call dirt. Now, ten years later, after studying agricultural engineering in India and hydrology in the Netherlands, I'm now doing my PhD in soil and land management. Now I realize that this dirt is not just my business. It is our business. It is the business of governments. It is the business of big brands like Gucci. It is the business of people like you and me. Today, I want to change the way you think about soils. If I were to ask you why soils are so important, then probably the first answer would be for food production. But yes, almost all the food that we eat comes from our soils. We also need soils for clothes, shoes, and bags, because the raw materials for these, the wool and leather, comes from animals grazing on our soils. Many of our medicines come from soils. Our building materials come from soils. Yet, we deplete and damage 12 million hectares of soil every year. That is one third the size of Germany. And why should we care about this? Well, let me tell you a story. I grew up in India in a metropolitan city called Chennai. When I was in school, we used to go on an annual trip to the zoo on the outskirts of the city. I loved the bus ride from my school to the zoo because when I looked out of the window of the bus, I would see lots of agricultural fields and greenery. But by the time I finished school and started college, many of these agricultural fields were gone. And in their place stood fancy high-rise buildings. The IT revolution had come to India. The IT sector needed office space, and the people who were coming in, they needed accommodation. So many of these agricultural fields were bought off at cheap prices. And in a span of only 10 years, the area of agricultural land was 10 times lesser than what it was initially. And did our lives go on as it was before? Of course not. Prices of onions, tomatoes, and other vegetables skyrocketed. And it hasn't come down a lot from then ever since. There are similar stories in almost all the developing countries around the world. On the one hand, we have a decreasing area of agricultural land. And on the other hand, we have increasing population. So we repeatedly sow and harvest crops without giving our soil resources a chance to recover. And when the soil gets depleted of its nutrients, we try to replenish it using artificial fertilizers. So basically, it's like this. I have a headache. If I eat well and rest, it probably might go away on its own. But no, I have deadlines. So I eat pills to cure my headache. And when those pills don't work, I take stronger pills. And at one point, my body won't be responsive to pills anymore. It will just get tired. This is exactly what happens to our soils. In our urgency to get more out of the land, our soils just become tired. What would happen if all of the world's soils become tired? What would happen to our food? Such questions form the basis of my research at the United Nations University here in Dresden. What can we do so that we are able to feed the world's growing population 
but with very minimal impact on the environment. How can we make sure that we more or less leave these resources in the same way for future generations? So this is a concept that we call a sustainability. So the basic question is, how do we bring about sustainable food production? Well, the answer largely depends on how we manage our soil, especially for agriculture. So in my research, I try to find out how the soil responds to all these different agricultural practices. For example, what comes to your mind when you think of agriculture? Maybe a big wheat field with some heavy machinery on them, like tractors. But did you know that tractors compact the soil? And compaction is not good for the soil. In fact, we get up to 60% lesser yields from compacted soils. But we cannot do away with heavy machinery in our farms. Well, one solution is to confine these heavy machinery into the same parts of the field over and over again, so that only a portion of the field is damaged. Another example of what I study is on how the soil responds to plowing. So generally, we plow the soil before we sow seeds. So we basically turn over the soil. And we tend to do this quite intensely. But we have seen that the more intense the plowing, the more harmful it is for the soil. So if we were to adopt a strategy that only minimally disturbs the soil, then the soil tends to retain its quality for a longer number of years. And there's something else that we are also studying, and this one's my favorite. It's called crop rotation. If we grow the same crops over and over again, then the same nutrients would get depleted from the soil. But if you plan in such a way that the nutrients taken up by one crop is replenished by another crop, then the soil can preserve its quality for a longer number of years. And we wouldn't need to add a lot of artificial fertilizers. I'm not saying that artificial fertilizers are unnecessary. No, it is necessary. But it should be like chemotherapy for cancer. It should be targeted. It should not be the main source of nutrition for the soil. So we have a field site here in Germany where we experiment such ideas. So that is my project partner with his head literally in the dirt. And that is me trying not to get the dirt in my hair. So I get data from this field site, and I use it to run my model to see how the soil responds to these different practices. I also try to get data sets from different parts of the world, because then I can see how the soil responds under different climates, on different locations, and on different soil types. We do this because we believe that if we are able to predict how the soil would respond, then we would enable lawmakers and governments to make better use of their land and soil resources. And not just lawmakers and governments. I mentioned Gucci in the beginning. What do they have to do with the soil? Well, brands like Gucci, they make clothes and handbags and shoes, and many of their raw materials come from soils. But now such brands themselves are trying to ensure good soil management using sustainability principles, and this means serious business. In India, too, the same IT sector that took away most of the agricultural land in my city is seeing a slow transformation. Many of the IT employees are going back to the agricultural roots. They support good farming practices in the weekends, especially. With time, the government will also have to pitch in their support. Maybe at least the remaining agricultural fields will still be there. So wrapping up, what can we do 
people like you and me, to support soil conservation? Well, the first thing is to be aware. For a period in my life, I thought that food came from the supermarket, that it was readily available, and there was more in the storage section of the supermarket. But such thinking must change. We need to be aware of what we are eating, how it is being produced, and what are the consequences to the environment. As consumers, we can support food products that have sustainability labels on them. By doing so, we can be mindful of what we are consuming and can be mindful of supporting environmental-friendly products. And if we have gardens, we can try and put in the effort to see if there are natural ways to replenish the lost fertilizers rather than only depending on artificial fertilizers. Nobody likes dirty business, but it is this dirt that would take us and our planet towards a healthy and sustainable future. Thank you.